Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. Pop quiz time. So what does Kelly Mutu, cocktails and cat litter have in common? Well, the answer is my guest this week on People First, Jeff Kirshner. Jeff is a former world backpacker turned bartender. He's also a serial entrepreneur with a love of storytelling, and I'm looking forward to the story he's going to share with us today. And this goes back to when his four-year-old daughter saw a plastic tub of cat litter in the woods. Little did Jeff realize that it would be the spark for creating Litterati, a movement that's crowdsourcing, cleaning the planet. Now in 185 countries, the Literati community identifies, maps, and collects waste, resulting in an open litter database, the largest of its kind. Literati is backed by Silicon Valley investors, the National Science Foundation, and has been highlighted at TED. And Jeff's work has been featured by the National Geographic Society, Rolling Stone, Fast Company, and Forbes. Jeff, welcome to People First. Morag, it is a pleasure to be here. Okay, well, I am so excited to learn more about Literati. And in the conversations that we've had in preparation for this, you'll know that I have a passion and a curiosity um, behind what you are helping all of us to do when it comes to the planet. But before we get to that story, I want to go back to your origin story. So when you were a four-year-old, when you were a four-year-old and your teacher was saying, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? What was your answer then? I wanted to be a hockey player. I lived oh, in Phil- yeah, I lived in Philadelphia. Yeah. Big hockey town. The Philadelphia Flyers were fantastic. And I thought nothing would be cooler than to be skating on the ice with several broken teeth, holding a stick and shooting a puck. That's what I wanted to be. And so were you any good at sports at school? I was. Uh-huh. I was pretty good. I could hold my own. Yeah. So ice hockey or were you in more traditional? I mean, ice hockey is not untraditional, but were you in other um, group sports, solo sports at school? Yeah. So soccer or football, as the rest of the world calls it, and baseball were my two go to sports where I, I guess, excelled the most. But hockey was what I really wanted to do. I wasn't good enough to play. And that's probably why at the age of five, I ended my career. But (laughs) really, you know, the idea was I wanted to be an athlete. Mm-hmm. And the thought that, you know, I would have paid you to let me play professional sports. That's how much I was into it. But well, to, to the extent there's a Hall of Fame for five-year-old um, ice hockey players, I'm sure your jersey and your number has been retired there. Hanging All right. Room. So sports for fun. So what was the pivot point then that brought you into adulting and certainly brought you up to literati? I think it was a trip around the world. You know, I, after college, I graduated from the University of Michigan having no clue what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So I applied to law school. Because okay. that's what you do when you have no clue what you want to do. And I effectively got out before I ever got in and chose to pursue a different path. And it was a path of bartending and teaching kids how to play soccer. Because that's just what felt right to me at the time. And I had met some people who had spent months traveling around the world. And I thought, you can do that. People actually do this sort of thing. And I was so inspired by the stories I was hearing, tales of far off places that I thought, that's what I'm going to do next. And so I set off for a year and traveled fairly extensively. And I think that really was a seminal moment um, in becoming an adult. So as we got ready for this conversation, I was asking you for some of the off the beaten track places. And so Kelly Mutu in Indonesia was one of the places that I used in the introduction. So tell me what stood out for you about Kelly Mutu that made it, ah, that was one of the off the beaten track places. Well, it has this lunaresque type feel. It's otherworldly. Um, it is three volcanic craters that are in the far eastern regions, uh, a far eastern region of uh, Indonesia. And there's just not a lot of people that go there, certainly not of not a lot of Westerners. And so and it's also not easy to get to. Mm-hmm. And so the thought that suddenly I was standing on this very different, very remote, far off place was so inspiring and so enlivening to me. It was energizing that I thought this is this is how I want to spend 
a good portion of my life is finding places like this. So to what extent did that change you and bring you back to literati versus you could have continued to be an explorer and an endless backpacker? What was it a, about that journey then that or what has it left with you? What was the legacy it's left with you? Yeah, that it's okay to live your life differently than the way you grew up. So I think the, the biggest takeaway from that experience was that there are a lot of people who find happiness in all different uh, pursuits. I grew up in an area that was, you know, people became lawyers, teachers, doctors. It was a bit white collared, if you will. But traveling introduced me to artists and potters and people who were doing things that I had never dreamt of doing. And they were totally happy. Mm -hmm. And I think that seeing how the rest of the world lives was a great way of building empathy and understanding that there's a whole way you could live life that you may have not considered before. How it led to literati was I knew I wanted to come back to the, the United States and I wanted to eventually start on some sort of career trajectory. And so that was sort of the, the kick in the butt to, to do that. So start a career trajectory, you're going to start with being an entrepreneur and a startup. I mean, that's like going in at the deep end several times over. And I know literati is more than just clean up after ourselves. So tell us, for those who are listening, what, what is literati all about? We are all about collecting the data of every object, material, and brand that is leaking out onto our planet. So how do we truly create a litter-free world? And how do we get to the root cause of the problem? Whether it's what are the policies that are in place, the packaging that needs to change, the infrastructure that needs to change. How do we really solve this problem beyond just let's go clean up another beach? And for us, it starts with the data. So there is an and in there because, yes, we can pick up a, 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 um, after ourselves. But one of the things that have stood out for me around that whole conversation around global um, pollution and the artifacts that we are discarding is right now it can feel like it's down to me as the consumer, that it is my fault and therefore my problem to solve for this versus an inclusive one that also says, well, at the beginning of the supply chain, the people who are producing it, but it, it is complex. So help us understand that tangled web around how do we do this? I think you hit the nail on the head when you said inclusive. What we're finding at Literati is that there's a lot of blame mm -hmm. going around. People are pointing fingers. And that may be one way to try to mitigate the problem. But our perspective is, is that we all share in this responsibility. And it does start at the beginning of the supply chain with packaging and, and the manufacturing process and through the retail and distribution and consumption and recycling and the end of life cycle for that packaging. Um, we all play a role in this game. Super complicated, really difficult to figure out how to solve it and where to start on this journey. Mm -hmm. For us, it was, how do you get to the root cause of the problem? Because if you don't understand the root cause, all the solutions that you bring to bear may be off. Mm -hmm. It may not actually solve the problem that we're trying to solve. And that's why the data piece is such a significant part of what we do. Because once you understand from a holistic perspective exactly what's leaking out into the environment and where it's leaking out to, it lets you understand why. Mm -hmm. And when you understand why, then you can come up with solutions that you can test and measure and see if they actually work. So how does that data collection work? So with Literati, there is an iOS and Android mobile application. Anybody can download it. And it's through the simplicity of a photograph. You snap a photo, and that photo, a, a photo of litter that's in the environment, whether it's a Starbucks cup, a cigarette butt, or plastic bottle cap, and we use computer vision models to identify through that photograph exactly what are the objects, what are the materials, and what are the brands. And everything is time-stamped and geotagged, and we use all that data at, in aggregate to understand what is a litter fingerprint for all Boulder, Colorado, if you will, right? Or all of Jakarta. 
And understanding that on a block by block basis allows us to come up with really interesting insights and mm. really interesting campaigns to try to change things. So tell us what some of those interesting insights are, obviously not necessarily correlated with Boulder just down the road from me or some of those other locations, but I, I presume like, for example, when a piece of plastic is left out in the, in the environment, it gets weathered, it loses its sticky label, but you're saying your photo identification will still know the origin of whether that was a drinks bottle or a food carton and, or a bit of a something else. From, well, from the photo that I upload. Yeah, so back to how complicated this is, that depends. So okay. if that label has been decomposed by 80%, maybe we can identify it, maybe not. If it's pristine and it's packaging the same way it was when it was purchased off the shelf, mm -hmm. then we got a better shot okay. at it, right? Um, but you asked a question about like some of those insights and how that mm. change, because that's what everybody's after is change, right? So I'll give you an example. It's one of my favorites. The city of San Francisco wanted to understand what percentage of litter came from cigarette butts. Okay. And the reason they wanted that data was they were creating a tax on all cigarette sales. And so at the time there was a 20 cent tax on cigarette sales, right? And that 20 cent tax went back to the city to help them clean up, but they didn't think it was enough. Our data was used to look at the city holistically, and it actually drove a doubling of that tax, which generates $4 million a year for the city of San Francisco to clean itself up. So if you think about what the technology and the data did, it was how do we turn what's invisible, the cigarettes lying on the street, to something that's visible through the data so that it can be used to create change. In this case, the change was providing more dollars to San Francisco to help the city keep itself clean. So you're differentiating between, um, there's more that goes into a cigarette butt than just paper-based, but paper-based litter from plastic litter to aluminum cans to whatever. So there's the different flavor I'm gonna use or uh, of material. That's right, and right. then I'm also thinking, as you think about the city, if I discard my cigarette butt appropriately in the trash can, is that still classed as litter by literati or are you only looking at the ones that have been stubbed out on the street corner or thrown out of the car window into the, the street? The latter. Only okay. those materials, whether it's a cigarette butt or a can, that have not been placed where they are supposed to be placed. And by the way, that differs city by city. Mm -hmm. Some items are recyclable in some locales that are not in other locales. Yep. Back to the complexity of this problem. Well, it's not just that, and I'm just thinking about over the recent years, how some metropolitan areas even removed trash cans because of the s safety risk or the security that was therefore uh, afforded or the illusion of security that was afforded because things are now not hidden in the, the can. But of course, now that means I'm carrying this empty bottle and unless I am being thoughtful and bringing it home, then you're increasing the street-born uh, debris that people are leaving or the standing it on the signpost that we've all seen, um, because that is the only option that somebody has chosen to take in that moment. So it's the breakdown in the whole system that you're flagging in addition to the what it is that's being discarded. That's right. And I think the way you articulated that is accurate. It is a system and there are multiple players and a lot of ego and a lot of money at stake. And so what is the way that Literati can play its unique part as part of that system? That's what we have been on a journey to really figure out over the, you know, the lifespan of the company. So you're in 185 countries. So that means people are paying attention and listening. So what has been most exciting for you and optimistic for you in terms of who's listening and who's doing as a result of the data and the impact the Literati is having? So I'll answer that in two ways. Um, the first is some of our clients who are just delighted with the fact that they're seeing improvement in their locations, right? We work with the city of Lodi, California. Um, mm -hmm. We work with Memphis, Tennessee, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they're starting to see how they can really engage their own citizens mm -hmm. to become part of the solution. And so the more we can provide value to our customers, the cities, who can then engage their citizens there's very few things that delight us more at Literati. The other answer is 
the individuals who are desperate to be part of a solution, right? Whether it's the 70 year old woman who's been walking the beaches of Santa Monica, cleaning up for the last 40 years, or the 14 year old mm -hmm. eighth grade student who has sustainability as a key thing that they want to pursue in their life. What we're learning is that so many people are desperate to contribute to making a cleaner, healthier planet, whether it's through climate change or saving the oceans, and they don't know where to turn. And if we can put a very simple, tangible solution in their hands so that they can feel that they're contributing to uh, a more sustainable future, that's such a rewarding place to be. And that's what we're seeing as well. See, that's what I, I like, that those examples you've given. It, a, it's empowering and amplifying the individual voice, the picking up a trash on my walk to school or whatever it might be. It's helping the community because now the municipalities are getting better information about where and, and what sort of litter is being dropped. So do we need to build a recycling plant or find a way to do it? Are you also then seeing that the data is able to influence and change legislation and change the production habits that are embedded within the supply chain at all levels. We have, and that's been really inspiring to watch as well. I'll give you an example. In the Netherlands, there is a small candy and it's called Antiflu and it's wrapped in a small plastic wrapper. And members of the Dutch literati community collected tens of thousands of these Antiflu wrappers and took the data to the company, actually took the data to the CEO the company, the parent company is called mm -hmm. Carrasco. And when the CEO saw a map of where all of their wrappers were ending up on the ground in the Netherlands, he committed to changing the supply chain. And it took nine months, which is not that long. Uh, to change, no. Change the Antiflu packaging from plastic to paper and they seal it with wax. And that is an example of how the data can be used to inspire a company to make a change to take something that if it ends up on the ground, plastic is gonna have a much longer life cycle uh, to, to really, um, excuse me, it's gonna have a much longer time to disintegrate than something like paper, mm -hmm. biodegradable and, and will be much less harmful to the environment. That's yeah. one example. So as you look to the near future then for literati, and of course there's the long-term Everest, a clean planet would be phenomenal. Um, but what are the near-term goals and aspirations that you have for the organization and the legacy and impact it's having? Essentially, we're trying to do something that's never been done before, right? And so when you're creating a market, I think it's imperative to understand, are you doing something that you think is cool? Or are you doing something that actually creates value for others? It's too easy to be stuck in your own head and stuck in your own offices and say, no, 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 this is what we need to do. This is where the product and the service should go. But if you're not out there talking to the public, talking to clients and customers and saying, is this truly helpful? Is this truly solving your problem? I think you're wasting your time. And so that is, for me, the immediate short-term goal, working with our existing city clients and our existing corporate clients to understand not only are we continuing to deliver value for you right now, but what else could we do to expand the value that we're providing? really listening aggressively to what they're saying and how we're solving their pain is, is really at the top of my list of to-dos. And it's a constant that never goes away. So I'm going to challenge everybody listening and watching this episode, download the app, start small and tag it and bin it. So as you're on your walks, pick it up, tag it, bin it. And it's the first step in helping to get that data to affect change. But Jeff, as you've grown through and as literati has exploded across the world, how has your own leadership journey been affected by that? I mean, what does leadership and being a great leader mean for you? And how has it morphed as literati has taken off? That is a great question. It has morphed. It has evolved. Um, you know, initially it was a leadership of one. Mm -hmm. and ensuring that my say-do ratio, as we like to say at Literati, was a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning did I do what I said I was going to do? As the team has grown, as we've taken on investor capital, as we've you know, brought on clients and grown the community, my job has changed in the sense that 
I now see my primary responsibilities as ensuring everybody else has what they need. Mm -hmm. I, I really aspire to be a servant leader. I look up to those leaders who take that methodology to heart. Right? How can I ensure that my team has what it needs? How can I make sure that I'm the last one to eat, et cetera? And so that changes on a daily level, right? Because on one day I may be really helping our head of marketing figure out messaging. On another day, it's around finance. And so constantly switching from one to the next has been something that's been new for me. And I've had to really, I think, change by not going as deep in one given area and staying a little bit more high level and trusting the team that I've put in place to do exactly what they've been brought on to do. So going back to your say do comment, that's easy to say. And I know having done it, that apparently there is not just the Morag way of doing things and trusting others to do something that might be similar or different, but get to the same end result. There is a, a, a gap as we unlearn, just give it to me, I'll just do it as quick as do it myself. So what, what's one piece of advice you have for leaders who are making that transition from being the doer, having to roll up their sleeves, to having to take more of a, a bigger picture overview? How do they check themselves? Or how do you check yourself in the moment? That's, uh, it is so difficult. I think you have to trust your gut. And ideally, you have to delegate to the team that you've put in place. And hopefully that's more fun as well. I'll tell you, one of the, the biggest challenges that I've faced as a leader is when those two things are at odds. So let's say, for example, there's a particular item we're discussing at Literati, and I feel pretty strong that this is the way we should go forward. But the team, who I absolutely trust, feels that there's a different, more effective way to go forward. How do you wrestle with those two competing ideas? Mm -hmm. Trusting in your gut, trusting in your team at a time that they disagree with what your gut says. That to me as a leader is one of the most challenging situations to face. And in the end where I've netted out is you really wanna trust your team because that's why they're there. And ideally if it's a situation that they're closer to, they see something that maybe you don't. It's not always like that, but that's been one key lesson learned. Okay, so you talked about servant leadership and so on. So who are the leaders that you admire not necessarily you're trying to emulate, but that you admire as role models for the, the type of leadership legacy that you would like to leave. Hmm. You put me on the spot with this one. I did. So it's a bit of a cliche perhaps, um, and he is an icon, but John Wooden, who is the famous basketball coach from UCLA, mm -hmm. um, whose success speaks for itself, his leadership style is one that I really admire. And, you know, in many ways it boiled down to, you do the work the right way. You are intentional about how you show up. The mm -hmm. outcome may not be what you had hoped for, but if you practice the fundamentals, and again, you're intentional about everything from how you lace up your shoes to how you show up to practice. That to me is really a, the way I try to lead and the way I try to live. Where that also can be helpful is it can lessen the attachment to outcome. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners and a lot of leaders, they suffer from this. I, I can get really attached to the outcome. Did we succeed or did we fail? Go Say ahead. more about that. That's, that just went, huh? That, yeah. That's powerful. So letting go of the outcome. But isn't that what we're trying to do is achieve the results, a clean planet? Or yeah. you... Huh. Same so to be clear, it's letting go. And by the way, like, I don't do this well. But letting go of the attachment to the outcome. I can't control much of that outcome. But what I can control is how I show up today. That much I can do because when you're so focused on the outcome, a future scenario, you're not in the present. You're not as mindful as you could be. And if instead I can just be here in the now and say, what is the problem I need to focus on right now? That is the most important. 
And ideally, if we do it right, and our, if our strategies are correct, and our tactics are right, and we have the right team in place, and about a thousand other things, then hopefully the outcome will be what we want. Mm. Yeah, it's starting to settle for me, because if we get too wrapped up in the outcome, and I know as a parent, the outcome of successfully raising boys, for example, as a parent, it means that occasionally when they didn't understand the outcome, my voice would go up, get louder, I would become more directive, I would be less listening. I still have those tendencies. But what you're saying is, forget the raising successful young adults, let's just focus on the next 24 hours. And each of those is the baby step to the end goal. That's right. I, I Powerful, powerful stuff there, Jeff. Thank you for, for sharing that. So, um, how can people learn more about Literati? You mentioned the iOS, the um, the Android app, etc. Where and how do we get more? We're on all of the you know social media channels. Our website is literati.org. Those are the easiest ways. And look, if you want to email me, I'm just Jeff at literati.org. Always happy to chat. Look at that. Your floodgate's going to open. Jeff, thank you for joining me here on People First. I look forward to seeing the ongoing success and impact of Literati and your team and you in the years to come. Morag, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies. <laughs>